Well, another election season has come and gone without either presidential candidate stepping foot in either Oregon or Washington. We're pretty much used to that by now, but it wasn't always that way. Hey, John Kerry, can you give my wife a kiss? All right. Yeah. How about that? Back in 2004, Democrat John Kerry campaigned in Oregon, where he met with voters downtown. That same year, George W. Bush and his wife Laura came to Oregon. They visited with students in Southern Oregon, and then later the pair visited Southridge High School in Beaverton. I'm pretty sure I was there to cover that one. But this year, not so much. Former President Trump's campaign didn't even pay to be included in the Oregon voters pamphlet, which set off a landslide of misinformation and harassment toward the Oregon Secretary of State. He is on the ballot, though. Both parties pretty much assume our electoral votes will go to Kamala Harris. President Biden won Oregon by a lot four years ago. Still, President Trump did get 958,000 votes in Oregon four years ago, which ain't nothing. But apparently, it's not enough to get either side to campaign here. We've been getting a lot of messages like this one from Mike, who asked, why in the world do we still use this outdated and totally wrong electoral college system? This does not reflect the will of the people or the majority vote. Oregon basically has no vote since we're not a swing state. That's a fair question. The U.S. is the only country in the world that elects our presidents the way that we do. We decided to explore the reason why. You remember the electoral college from your high school civics class, right? If it's been a while, that's okay. Here's a refresher. Each state gets a number of electoral votes based on the number of legislators they have, which is based on population. In Oregon, that's eight, six representatives and two senators. After you cast your vote, whoever wins your state's popular vote, the vote of the people, gets all of your state's electoral votes. Well, everywhere except for Maine and Nebraska, that is, they split theirs by congressional district. That means that in many states, the electoral winner is a foregone conclusion. Take Oregon, considered solidly democratic. So is Washington. So all eight of our votes with the Electoral College are likely going to go to the Democratic candidate. This year, of course, that's Kamala Harris. Let's take a look at the numbers. Total votes in the Electoral College, 538. That's the same as the number of members in Congress, plus three more for Washington, D.C. Winning the presidency takes 270 votes, just over half the available votes. 191 electoral votes exist in states that are solidly Democratic, and another 35 will likely go that way, too. On the other side, 122 electoral votes come from solidly Republican states, and another 97 are likely. That leaves 93 toss-up votes. Those are the battleground states we hear so much about. The seven states that have enough votes between them to swing the election one way or another. That's why you see the candidates going so hard in those places and generally ignoring the rest of us. But how did we get here? Blame the Founding Fathers. The Founding Fathers really had suspicions of the mass public. They thought most of the voting public, which at that time was exclusively white male landowners, could too easily be swayed by conspiracy theories and misinformation. So the idea was the Electoral College would be this filter, and so the model at the time was that these electors would um, you know, get together and would not necessarily follow the will of the popular vote, but rather would discuss and deliberate and choose uh, the best candidate for president. So who are these eight people that we're trusting to cast our votes for Oregon? They're chosen by their political party. Here's Oregon Democratic Party Chair Rosa Colquitt. They are elected in our county parties by our county party delegates and leadership. And our electors are also elected in our six congressional districts. After the popular vote is cast, they fill out a form that comes from the Secretary of State. Uh, and our, all electors pledge and fill up, sign the form agreeing that we will support the candidate who is the nominee who is elected. Remember, in Oregon and most other states, it's winner take all. So we're not free agents doing what we think we'd like to do, but we make a commitment to support the candidate who is elected. This is a, a magnanimous responsibility. Our electors take it in that manner. But is this really the best way to be electing a president in 2024? Five times throughout American history, the winner of the popular vote did not win the Electoral College. 
That happened back in 1824, 1876, 1888, and 2000, when George W. Bush beat Al Gore in an election that came down to the Supreme Court. And then again in 2016, when Donald Trump won the Electoral College vote against Hillary Clinton, even though she got 2.9 million more votes from the people. Over the years, there have been attempts to abolish the Electoral College, but it is a steep hill to climb. It takes a constitutional amendment, which smaller states are not likely to go for. But reforms are possible. You know, there is a, a thing that could be done um, in Oregon. It's done in a small number of states, in Maine, in Nebraska. We could allocate our electoral votes, not necessarily as a winner-take-all, but by congressional district. That, I think, would be a, a sort of middle ground solution that would encourage candidates to compete. Let's say in Eastern Oregon, you know, that would be a place where President, ex-President Trump would be very competitive. So if you're wondering, in light of the Electoral College, if your vote really matters, well, of course it does. A vote is the most precious thing we have. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have, and that is the vote. And so all of us as electors, we are working very hard. And not just for the race at the top of the ticket. We have a, 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 a congressional race in Oregon that is really could be one of the most critical races that determines the control of the House of Representatives, both the, the race in Washington and in Oregon. But also, there is a function of these elections that we don't want to forget, which is legitimacy, right? People vote, even if they're voting in a state where the results seem to be a foregone conclusion. It is really important to get your voice out there and to cast your ballot um, so that people know that Oregon's voice matters. And by the way, it is mathematically possible for the two candidates to end up tied in the Electoral College. The magic number is 270, but a 269 to 269 deadlock could happen. If, someone, if somehow that is the case, the newly elected members of the House of Representatives would get involved come January. You may have seen Veep, they did a whole episode on that. Each state delegation in the House would get a single vote, and if a candidate reached 26 votes, they would win and become president. It's actually happened twice before in our history. The last time was 199 years ago in 1825, when the House named John Quincy Adams the nation's sixth president.